The base form of an English adjective, like fast, can form a comparative faster and superlative fastest in order to compare the thing it is describing with other things. This is the fastest fox, i.e. this box is faster than all the others. English comparatives are a little bit complicated, in that adjectives with more than two syllables don't take the endings er uh and ust anymore, instead using the words more and most, like with more interesting and most interesting. Except suddenly you can form the er uh and ust endings with adjectives with more than two syllables, if that adjective is derived from a mono or disyllabic adjective, like unhappy, which obviously comes from happy and thus can form unhappier and unhappiest. So German adjectives are much easier. They always have an er uh comparative and a st superlative. Well, when superlative adjectives are used predicatively, they go in this special form for some reason. And there are other phonological processes going on as well. A lot of adjectives take umlaut for their comparative and superlative versions. That is, their vowels change, as in groß to größer, größten. And sometimes you get random consonant changes, like hoch, which goes to hör in the comparative, and then back to höchsten in the superlative. So Danish adjectives, actually, you know what, let's just show the table. These languages all have their own complications when it comes to comparatives and superlatives, but ultimately the way these are formed is similar throughout. These languages are quite closely related. They are the Germanic languages, a subgroup within the larger Indo-European language family. And another thing they all have in common is this paradigm. The English good, better, best. German gut, besser, am besten. Swedish bra, better, best. Danish Sorry, what? What's going on with Swedish? Did Swedish just decide to be special? Well, Norwegian also has the word bra. Both it and god take bättre and best as comparative and superlative forms. The words are largely synonymous, though there are subtle differences and they tend to be preferred in different contexts. So is this a North Germanic thing? Well, Danish doesn't have this word. And this is further complicated by the fact that Swedish does have the word god. It describes a positive taste or smell. Gud mat is tasty food, while tastier food is gudare mat, and the tastiest food is den godaste maten. And looking at this regular paradigm in Swedish, I think, draws attention to the actual question we should be asking about this table. Before we get to explaining the exception, how about we explain the rule? Why is the comparative of good better? I said earlier that these are all Germanic languages. They are related, and their most recent common ancestor is a language linguists call Proto-Germanic. A proto-language is a methodological reconstruction of an ancestor language of a particular language family. Proto-Sino-Tibetan is the proposed ancestor of the Sino-Tibetan languages, Proto-Bantu is the ancestor of the Bantu languages, and so on. This should not be confused with something like Latin. Latin is the ancestor language of the modern Romance languages, but it's not a proto-language. We know precisely when and in what form Latin existed. We have an enormous corpus of texts written in the language and describing the language. Proto-Germanic, meanwhile, has like, a few scraps of words that might have belonged to it, written down by some Romans, and is therefore almost entirely constructed by linguists in the modern day, as a model of what was spoken by the Germanic tribes around 400 BC to 200 AD. The proto-Germanic ancestor of good is Gorda. That asterisk there means that the word is not attested, but rather a reconstruction. And we can see that in the old Germanic languages, including Gothic, a language of the extinct East Germanic branch, we already have this paradigm. Indeed, the ancestor of Beta is already present in Proto-Germanic, reconstructed as Batis. And it is the comparative of Gorda. To solve our mystery then, let's go even further back. The ancestor of Proto-Germanic is Proto-Indo-European, which is the common ancestor of all the Germanic, Italic, Indo-Iranian, Slavic, and Hellenic languages, among others. And Proto-Indo-European has two adjectives here. It has this thing, a root meaning to unite or to fit together, whence Germanic Gorda and its descendants, and also, in a roundabout way, the Russian Vygoda, meaning advantage. And it has this thing, a root meaning good, which can be seen in the old Indric Badra, meaning happy. Maybe both adjectives existed in early Proto-Germanic, maybe not. It's hard to draw strict boundaries between stages of a language at the best of times, let alone when we're talking about the hypothetical brain children of linguists and archaeologists. The point is, at some point in the development of or into Germanic, these two words became one. This process is called suppletion, and is a common way in which irregularity emerges in languages. If we look at something like fast, faster, fastest, it would be weird to consider these separate words, right? They are forms of the same word, and together form a paradigm, a set of word forms. Similarly, good, better, best is a single paradigm. Better is a form of good, but this is a suppleted paradigm, because the words in it come from different sources. That's different to just being irregular, like our old German friend Hoch, Hör, Höchsten, where the forms are weird, 
but they're still all etymologically related. What typically happens in suppletion is that where you have synonyms, especially frequently used synonyms of common words, they merge to patch up different parts of a paradigm. What might have happened in Proto-Germanic then is that when this Gortha root came to mean, well, good, but there was already this root for good, instead of either word being replaced, Gortha lost its comparative and superlative forms, and Batis lost its base form. And this doesn't just happen to adjectives. Take the verb go and its past tense went. Etymologically, those have nothing to do with each other. For an example of a noun, the standard Arabic for woman is imra'a, but its plural is nisa'a. So now we come to the present day, and there's only one question left to answer. What's going on with Swedish? Well, there's one thing I wasn't entirely honest about. See, Swedish does have the word good, not only in the meaning tasty, but also good in other ways, in loads of set phrases and weird little contexts like a good friend, good morning, merry Christmas, a morally good person. And here, the comparative is bättre, the superlative is best. Just like in Norwegian, in these cases, bra and god take the same comparative forms. But the forms godare and godast have absolutely been in common use for over a hundred years in the meaning I was talking about, and have been attested as far back as 1692. It seems, then, that the word god underwent a different morphological process, one that tends to produce more regular patterns, proportional analogy. Proportional analogy is where the form of a word is changed by analogy with how that form works elsewhere in the language system. For instance, the Old English plural of book is beach, but if we look at other parts of the system, like stan or kop, where we get the plurals stanas and koppas, we see a certain pattern emerge for plurals. So we transfer the logic of that pattern onto our book, and by the time Middle English rolls around, the paradigm is book, bukes. This generally eliminates odd ones out and increases regularity across the lexicon, but in the Swedish example, it's almost like this process was never fully completed for the word god, and you just end up with an even more confusing paradigm, with context-dependent branching paths of inflection. So by proportional analogy, the word god generated, if you will, the forms godare and godast, using those are and ast forms we saw at the beginning essentially reinventing the comparative and superlative forms of the old Proto-Germanic Gorda. So, is this what's happened with bra as well? Betre and best have generated their own base form to stem from? As satisfying a conclusion as that might be, no. An observation you might make about the word bra, which holds true for both Swedish and Norwegian, is that it's completely invariable. In both of these languages, adjectives need to agree with their nouns in gender and number. Gud, for instance, becomes got in the neuter, and goda or gode in the plural. But bra doesn't. It always stays the same. And why is that? Because it's a weird loanword. It comes from the French brave, ultimately from the Italian bravo. And even though this loanword, bra, clearly is not fully integrated into the language system, since it's still invariable, in terms of comparatives and superlatives, it just neatly slotted itself into a pre-existing paradigm. And there you go, uh, that's the end of the video. Now you know why the Germanic adjectives for goods form this pattern. Mm -hmm.